Go ahead and be seated. Go ahead and be seated. Hey, let's, let me say a quick prayer. That, that song, let's, let's pray. Dear Father, I, we come to you and we praise you forever and ever. You are worthy of our praise. Glory is your name. Righteous you are. We do give you all the glory today. Father, this season is not a season where you, where we just are busy with the activities of buying and uh, meeting with others. But Father, this is a season where we just worship you. We worship you because of the good that you do. We worship you because of Christ. So I do, I do adore the glory of Jesus Christ, the goodness of Jesus Christ, the, the fame of Jesus Christ, the work of Jesus Christ. I want to be a better man because of Jesus. I want to be a man of courage. I want to be a man of faith. I want to be a man that isn't busy with trying to do life on my own, but busy with the one who made me his own. So I do come and I do adore you. I adore Jesus Christ above all, the king of this world, the savior of this world, the hope of this world. So, Father, I pray that the greatest gift you can give us this morning is a gift of worship. Would you give us the gift of worship that we can come to you, we have access to you because of Christ Jesus himself. We can't go to the Father without Jesus. We come to Jesus, come to the Father because of Christ. So, I worship you this morning. I worship you Jesus said in spirit and truth I do adore you I just want to sit here and I just want to experience what great love that is in you what great love that you give me I just want to sit and I want to experience the mercy that you have shown constantly in my life I pray that we can be people of worship we just magnify you glorify you all our lives. We love you, Jesus. We love what you did. We love who you are. We love what you're going to do. We thank you. To your son's perfect name is who we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, give it up for the worship team, y'all. Give it up. I don't know what it was, man. I was like, oh, Jesus, you're doing something in me. I don't know what it is, and, uh, but I'm glad to worship with you guys. Hey, I'm happy to be here. Last week, your boy was down for the count. The family and I, we, we got a little sick. Some of you don't believe me I got sick, but that's all right. God would deal with you. But, um, <laughs> but I'm happy. I am so excited to be here. Listen, little did I realize how much I would miss you guys. You know, this, this, is, my, this is what I would call my church family. And, and I love my church family. You know, my church family, we got uh, all sorts of people. And I, I'm, I'm grateful for this church and this campus. And I want you guys to know we love you and we're thankful for you. But also, where did he go? Why did he run? Also, I want to say thank you to my brother Logan for stepping in. Yeah, I'm talking about you, little man. I'm thankful for you. Uh, I mean, I'm thankful for him stepping in last minute. I told him, hey, man. You know, I'm not feeling well. You might need to get prepared. And man, did he come prepared and deliver a message. Preached on Exodus last week. So give it up for my friend one more time. Thank you for that. Well, I'm in the pulpit now. So, and you got me for the next six weeks. Just to let everybody know, all right? So you better get used to me. You, you, better, you better get uh, ready because I'm excited for these next several weeks. But today we're going to be continuing in a sermon series that we started last, not last week, but the week before, and the sermon series title is Called. And the most basic uh, a theme of this sermon series is that you and I would be busy doing what God wants us to do. Because if you've ever noticed, most of our relationship with God is, is asking God to do something for us, right? But, but now in this sermon series, we want to ask God, what does he want to do through us? right? We, we, we always spend our time just asking God to, to make our day better, which is great. I love that. We always ask God to, 
make our attitude better, which you need to do every single day. We always ask God of all these things, but you ever ask God, God, what do you want me to do? Like, God, what do, what do, you, what do you truly want me to do? I'm busy planning my own life, but what do you want me to do in my, in my life, the life that, that you gave me and that you created for me to live? So that's what this sermon series is, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to get an understanding that the church, that Christianity, is more than just coming here Sunday mornings and listening to a pastor yell at you with skinny things for 35, 40 minutes. <coughs> I don't know why he laughed. You know, I don't know who that guy is. But, uh, <laughs> but, but church is, is not the four walls, but it's the people beyond the four walls. Right? Church is in the building. Church is the people who come to a building and who go out on fire and fueled, ready to do the good work God wants them to do at their jobs and their families, whatever it may be. So that's what this sermon series is all about. Our purpose is to make an invisible God visible through us. That's our purpose, to make an invisible God visible through us. And, and, and we're going to lean into that more and more week by week and until, all we, until we get to our Christmas Eve services. Uh, you know, there's one thing that I've noticed about our world, and we're always about my life, that there are a lot of differences in, in, in us and around us. There's a lot of different people. For instance, we got black people, we got white people, Hispanic people, you have male and female. We have all sorts of differences that, 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 that we all have. We, have. we have scholars and scientists and stay-at-home moms, all are important. Uh, we have, we have uh, Starbucks lovers, and we have delusional Dunkin' Donuts lovers. I'm sorry, Dunkin' Donuts tastes like battery. Don't ask me how I know that. I just know it. It's just a, I know you're getting mad over there. It's okay. Relax. It's all right. It's all right. Relax. God loves you. It's all right. But he doesn't love Dunkin' Donuts. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of differences in us, right? Uh, uh, and, and those differences is what makes us unique. Those differences is what makes us beautiful. But if I can be honest, if there's one commonality that brings you and I together, if there's one thing that I can say, although we have a plethora of differences, if there's one thing that I feel that we all have in common, and it's, and it's got to be this, that we are all broken. Say that one more time because I don't think you heard me. You're kind of like, eh, eh, I, don't know about, I don't know about me, but maybe the person next to me. But let me say that one more time. We all have this thing in common that you and I are broken, flawed, sinful people in need of a cure. Right? We, we are in true need of a cure. Listen, we can get it right some days, but we often get it wrong a lot of days. Right? We can, be, we can have a good stretch. We can have a good streak for like two or three days where we're not hurting anybody. We're not, we're not having an attitude. But then that one time you get cut off in traffic and next year you know your whole day is ruined. Right? Now when I say broken, uh, when I say uh, we're all flawed and we all have a struggle, what I don't mean is that you and I are, are people who uh, leave our keys in our car and lock our car. What I mean by, I'm not saying that you, you struggle or you're broken to the sense where you lose your remote and you tear up your house to find it. Anybody have done that before? I don't know why I get so angry when we lose our remotes. It's just, it's like the worst thing ever. You like tear up the house, you stop everything. I can't find the remote, I can't find it. Right? <laughs> right? But, but what I mean by when we're all broken, I mean the thing that we struggle with that deeply scars our relationships. Right? What I mean by struggle with, what I mean by flaws, I mean, I mean the thing that, that deeply impacts your reputation, right? That, that deeply impacts your character. How, how about this? The thing that deeply affects your relationship with God. And here, here's what I want to say, friends. We're all sick. Now, when I say sick, you're probably like, well, hold on, bro. What you, what you mean by that? I gotta, I'm not sick. I don't, I don't know what you mean by that. But when I say sick, I mean sick in, in the sense where you and I are spiritually inadequate and inconsistent, and we are in need of a cure. And friends, can I tell you right now, we don't need another habit. We don't need a new discipline. We need the renewal of Jesus Christ. <coughs> what you and I need most in this world is not just something we can do more of, but having more 
of Christ in our lives because Jesus is the great physician who can heal the great brokenness that we struggle with. Can I tell you something right now, friend? You can't fix yourself. <coughs> Haven't we learned that already? Can I tell you right now, you cannot fix yourself. You're not a good fixer. Sure, you can fix the faucet, right? And I'm not talking about me. But sure, you can, sure you, can, you, can, you can do a couple things around the house when things aren't going the way that they need to. But when it comes to your heart, when it comes to your soul, friends, you need a physician. You, 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 need, a, you need a physician to come in that's greater and better. And what we're going to see today is that Jesus Christ is the cure to the things that we struggle with. Right? What we're going to see is Jesus Christ is the, is the cure to the things that we struggle with. There's one thing that my wife uh, gets mad at me about. She gets mad at me about a lot of things. Right? There's a plethora of them. We can have a laundry list uh, of things she can tell you she gets mad at me about. But there's one thing she does not like that I do is that I do not go to the doctor. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. I appreciate you. You saved by the blood over there. I love it, Keith. Amen. That's a Christian back there. She hates, she hates it when I don't go to the doctor, right? There could be something going on and something uh, 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 that, that, that's, you know, whatever it may be. And she's like, you need to go to a doctor. It's the last time you've been to the doctor. It's the last time you've been to the doctor. I'm like, listen, Jesus is my doctor, okay? I'm that Christian, okay? Whatever. I'm that Christian. <laughs> All right? Uh, but, but, but. But I find it interesting, I, I, I don't like going to the doctor because I have a hard time admitting something's wrong with me. Right? Aren't we all in that boat today? That we have a hard time admitting like something's wrong? And when I mean by something's wrong, I don't mean again that you just have a little nicks here and there. I mean something is deeply wrong with you. Right? But guess what? Jesus Christ is the one and the source of our renewal in our lives. So what I want to do today is I want us to, to read a passage of Scripture that really points to, to, to the Jesus that can redeem us, that can strengthen us, that can bring renewal in our lives, that can bring healing in our lives, and, and the Jesus that can not just give us a better, a better behavior, but a Jesus that can give us a new heart, right? A Jesus that can give you and I a new heart, a, a, a heart that, that seeks better and seeks newer in our lives. So if you have your Bibles, go to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, verses 13 to 17 is where we're going to be reading. If you got your Bibles, Mark chapter 2. This is the gospel of Mark, and Mark is nothing but autobiography of Jesus' life. And what Mark is going to paint to us is a Jesus that's worth pursuing, a Jesus that's worth following, all right? So Mark chapter 2, let's go ahead and pick it up, starting at verse 13. If you're there, say I'm there. Say I'm there. All right, cool. Perfect. All right, here we go. We got our Bibles. I like it. He says this. He, meaning Jesus, went out again beside the sea, and all the crowds were coming to him. And he was teaching them. So here's Mark giving us the background, giving us the context, giving us the location. Jesus is walking by the sea. There's one thing you need to know is Jesus loved the beach. All right? If Jesus was living here in 21st century, he would be living in Clearwater, Florida, in the beautiful beaches, Fort Lauderdale, somewhere around there, you know. Jesus loved the beach, all right? There's a lot of things Jesus loved, and he loved to hang out by the beach. Let's go ahead and read. Verse 14, and as he passed by, he, meaning Jesus, saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Uh, all of us need to know that Levi in this particular story happens to be Matthew who wrote the book of Matthew, right? In the ancient times, in, in ancient uh, Palestine, it was very common to have two names. For instance, you know, I'm Javon, a.k.a. Kevin Hart. You know, I have two names, right? I have, I have two different ways of how you can see me. You laugh because it's true. But, uh, right, and, and so this happens to be Matthew who wrote the book of Matthew. And it, and it goes on in verse 15. Listen to this, friends. This is awesome. I love this passage. And as he reclined at the table, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he, Jesus, eat with tax collectors and sinners? Verse 17. When Jesus heard it, 
He said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Hear that? But those who are sick. I have come, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. What a beautiful passage of Scripture. What, what, what a passage of Scripture where we see that God is able, is the only one who can change the human heart. Right? God, God, Christ is the only one that can bring renewal to a desperate soul. And, we're, and what we're going to see is that, that the source of our renewal, that we, we find our health in Jesus Christ. Right? Right? And we find our help in Jesus Christ. And I love this story because the story kind of paints us a picture of Jesus that we need. Right? The, a Jesus that we need. And what do we need? We need Jesus as a physician in our lives. There's a lot of things we call Jesus, right? He's Lord. He's Master. He's the Son of Man. The Son of God. There's a lot of names that Jesus carries. But I bet you've never thought about the name, the physician. I, I bet you've never thought about the name, the, the physician, the one who, who does the, the surgery in the heart in our lives. And Mark wants us to see that the thing that needs most healing can only be dealt with through Jesus Christ. Right? The sicknesses that we have, now when I say sickness one more time, I mean the thing that, that burdens much of your life. Jesus is the only one. So this story is beautiful. So let's go ahead and break this part down, break this portion down, and then get to the end. First of all, we need to realize Jesus is walking, and as he's walking, he's got a crowd of people with him. This is a very large crowd. When you read your Bible, don't think of it like this crowd or like 30, 50, 60 people. We're talking hundreds of people are following Jesus, right? His disciples are with him, right? This, this is just very early on. It's not all of them. His disciples are with him. Hundreds of people are following him. And as Jesus is walking, as all the people are following him, he spots one man. Don't you find that interesting? Right? Hundreds of people are following him. And Jesus looks and he sees a guy by the name of Levi. Didn't our friend Logan preach last week, God sees us? Weren't we encouraged last week? God sees us. Right? God doesn't look past you. Right? He actually sees you. He knows you. You are known by him. Isn't that a beautiful truth? And of all the people, Jesus sees Levi. And what is, who is Levi? And what is Levi doing? Well, Levi is sitting at the tax booth. So what we need to understand is Levi's occupa occupation is a tax collector. At this time, ancient Rome was ruled, I'm sorry, ancient Israel was ruled by Rome. Rome was an oppressor. What Rome would do is they would oppress all the nations that they ruled over, and the nation happened to be Israel. And so what Rome would do, a way of oppressing them, they would hire tax collectors. And all tax collectors were, were just of modern day IRS agents. And we all hate the IRS, not that I know anything about that, but you know, that's, that's pretty much what their, their occupation was. And what, what they would do is Rome would hire Jewish people to work for them. Jewish people would work for them. Now, Israel already hates Rome because they oppressed them. And they hate even more tax collectors. Because what tax collectors would do is they would take a little bit more off the top so they can get paid, and, and, and Rome allowed them to do it. For instance, let's say that you owed $100 in taxes. Well, what would happen is Rome would say, well, make that $200. And then next you know that $200 turns into $250. 200, uh, uh, 100 goes to Rome. Uh, uh, 100 or 50 goes to the tax collector. So they would make a little bit more off the top. They were hated. They were despised. No one wanted to be around tax collectors, right? They had a life where people questioned and people didn't want to be near them, right? They, they had a life where if you were a tax collector, you weren't around your family, right? You were friends with other tax collectors, as we see in this passage. You were a tax collector, you were, you were not only... Uh, 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 despised by your family, you, you weren't allowed to go into the synagogue to worship. It was a very lonely life. Right? You made a lot of money. Oh, you, oh, you got money. And we're going to talk about just a little bit how Levi has a house. Right? He's got a, he's got a home, which means in ancient times, this man has got money. But he's lonely. Doesn't have a lot of friends. Far from his family. 
but most importantly, far from God. Far from God. If you were a tax collector, you were definitely not someone who worshipped Yahweh. Definitely was someone who didn't worship God. But don't you love this story? Even though he's far from God, God comes to him. You see the beautiful picture of this? Right? Even though he's far from God, Jesus, God, draws near to him. I love this picture because this picture helps us to realize that, friends, you and I are desperate without God. So what does God do? God comes to you. Right? You didn't become a Christian because you figured it out. Because you just, you, you crossed the T's and you dotted the I's and you, you, you subtracted and you divided, even though I don't know how to do any of that right now. But you didn't figure it out on your own. Jesus Christ found you. And this is the heart of God. The heart of God is that he pursues you. Even when you don't pursue him, he's the one who pursues you. And why does God pursue you? Because he knows the one thing you need is him. It's him. Levi had no business, no business following Jesus. But Jesus is one who's full of grace and truth and mercy. How beautiful it is, friends, that, that we follow a God who is not allergic to our brokenness. Can I tell you right now, God's not allergic to the thing you struggle with. And you have a lot of struggles. Listen, we know it. You try to hide them, you try to act like they're not there. I remember one time I got in a car accident and my side rear view mirror fell off and don't ask how it happened, but it just happened and so I got this accident, the side of the uh, mirror fell off, and my dad, who happens to be very tacky, he's like, well, why don't you just put duct tape on it? And I'm like, no, stupid. Like, I need to fix this. Like, no, this makes no sense, right? But he's like, no, 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 no. Like, just cover it up, and when you cover it up, get the right color and do all of this, you know. But, 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 but if you do that, you save yourself money and all this other stuff. And, but don't we do the same, right? Try to cover up. Try to cover up. Try to act like nothing is wrong. Try to act like everything is good. And if somebody asks you, how are you doing? You'd be like, I'm fine. Then you're not. Right? But Jesus draws near to man so that we may become like him. This is our only hope. Our only hope in this world is God coming to us. This is what, this is what, what Advent Christmas season is all about. Am I right? Right? A man... Jesus Christ, born into this world, coming down to humanity. This is the beautiful story of Christianity. God coming down in the flesh. And the one thing I want you guys to realize is that Levi finds hope. Levi finds hope. Why? Because Jesus found him. Levi, he gets up from the tax booth and he follows Jesus. He follows Jesus. And, and, and what is Jesus doing at this moment? Well, what Jesus is actually doing at this moment, he's offering Levi a life that he cannot find in the world or in others. What's amazing about this story is that Jesus just got done a couple verses earlier talking about forgiveness. He just got done talking about forgiveness and, and, and how forgiveness is the one thing humanity needs more than ever. And so what does Jesus do? In Jesus' fashion, he puts it into practice. He makes it a reality. And he comes to Levi and he <coughs> offers Levi a life of forgiveness and a life of freedom. I believe, I believe at that moment, that they teach you in Bible school, don't make assumptions when you read the text. But I'm going to make one of this right here. <laughs> Shut up, Tony. I'm going to make one of this right here. I believe for the first time, Levi, Levi's shame was lifted off him. I felt, I believe in this first time, shame was gone. Right? Man, man had a lot of failures. Right? Being a tax collector was one of them. Now, I need you to help you to understand this. No Jewish boy in ancient Palestine wakes up and says, I want to be a tax collector. Right? 
no Jewish boy says, I want everybody to hate me. I want to defraud people of their money. I, I, I want to be hated and despised by the world. So how does he get here? Because I believe what Levi was doing was what a lot of us try to do in our lives. Levi was chasing the good life. He just was looking it in the wrong places. Levi was chasing the good life. Now, when I say the word good life, what do you think of when I say good life? For me and my wife, the good life is, I said it already, I'll say it again, Clearwater, Florida. That's the good life. That's the good life. Florida, even though it's been kind of cold in Florida, it, you know, but, but still, th that's what we call the good life. But in actuality, behind the scenes, what we're actually trying to say is we want comfort, right? We want comfort, right? And maybe you think the good life is a life where you have much success. Maybe you think the good life is a life where everybody likes you because Lord knows we want everybody to like us. Maybe the good life is you are debt-free. Lord, I pray for that every single day. But anyway, maybe you think the good life is your student loans are paid off. Whatever you think the good life is, we all are pursuing it every single day. But here's the beautiful truth. The good life that, that Levi was pursuing actually pursued him. Right? Actually pursued him. And here's the good life, friends. Here's the life that you and I truly want. A life of acceptance, a life of belonging, a life of love, a life of being loved and giving love. Guess what, friends? The good life is Jesus Christ. He is the good life. Knowing him, belonging to him, Jesus, he is the goal. He is the treasure. I love what one pastor says, D.A. Carson, he says this. He says, he says, man's greatest finding is when Jesus finds him. I love that. He says, man's greatest finding, and then he goes on and he reads in a section in his book, he says, the greatest treasure you can ever find is Jesus. Jesus is the treasure, friends. To be close to him, to know him, that's the goal. But, and, and notice Jesus doesn't say, follow me and I'll make life easy. Right? Notice Jesus doesn't say, follow me and you'll get every, whatever you want. He just says, follow me. Jesus is offering him. And he's offering you and I today a life with him. That's beautiful, friends. Isn't that beautiful? The, 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 the greatest thing we can ever achieve is Christ. He is the gift, and Levi finds it. Jesus doesn't tell Levi, hey, go and clean yourself up. Go, go, go and make everything right, and then come and follow me. Jesus is saying, hey, clean yourself up, and, and then maybe you can have a chance of following me. See, this is what makes Christianity unique all, above all the other world religions. See, all the other world religions, what they're doing is you have to do this, do that. You have to pray a certain amount. You have to go to a, a, a service a certain amount. You have to be perfect to the T. You can't skip one thing. And then if you do all that, maybe, just maybe, you can be with God and God will accept you. But you want to know what Christianity does? It flips it. Christianity says it's not up to you, but it's up to what Christ has done for you. Because here's the thing, friends. You don't clean yourself up and then go to Jesus. Jesus comes to you and cleans you up. That's the truth of the gospel, friends. That's the truth of the church. Right? We, don't, we, don't, we can't clean ourselves up. We can't make ourselves better. We can't do any of that without the pursuing work of Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that amazing? Right? I don't, I don't have to perform my way to God. Christ has done that for me. Christ's perfection in his work has accomplished that enough for me. So here's, here's what I want to do. I want, I want you to realize this, friends, and before we move on to the next verse, I want you to realize this. We need Christ to clean up our hearts today. Am I right? We need Jesus to get out the lights off. We need him. <laughs> we need him. That's the only, that's the only brand that I know because I don't clean that much. But anyway, um, we need him to, we need to get him, we need him to get out the stuff to do some cleansing work. To do some cleansing work in our hearts. Because friends, the only one who can cleanse you is Jesus. The only one who can fix you, not you. But it's Christ. The work of Christ. How can a man who was greedy 
now follow Jesus. Christ. Grace. Mercy. This is what makes Christianity so beautiful, is that Jesus does the work. And we don't do anything. <laughs> we don't do anything but follow him. And then I love how the scene uh, transitions. I love how the scene and where it goes. The scene transitions. And so Jesus goes to Levi and says, hey, Levi, follow me. Uh, the Bible says that Levi got up from the tax booth and followed him. Verse 15 is amazing. Notice this. This is awesome. Verse 15, Levi throws a party. Listen, Jesus loved the beach, and the man loved the party. The man loved the uh, dinners and meals and hanging out. Jesus loved to hang out with people, right? And, and what's going on at this, uh, at this celebration? What's going on at this dinner table? Levi, listen to this, friends. Levi invites his other friends to see Jesus. How beautiful is that, right? Levi invites his friends to his house, Levi's house, so they can meet Jesus. I love what another pastor says about this. He says, uh, although it was Levi's house, Jesus was the host. I love that. I thought it was pretty cool. Although it was Levi's house, Jesus was the host. And what does, what's going on here? Well, what's going on here is that Levi is so compelled and he wants his friends to know Jesus. Now let me stop right there. Let me stop right there. Those who are Christians in the room, eyes on me, eyes on me. Do we have that same compelling for people to know Jesus? To the point where we were invited. Listen, I don't know about you, that house had to be big. Because you had Jesus, you had maybe what, one, two, three, four, maybe five disciples at the time. All right, so that's six people. And then you got Levi, that's seven people. And then you got all these sinners and tax collectors. Man, it, it had to be like at least 20 people. This house had to be big, right? This house had to be pretty, pretty, pretty massive. And it gets to the point where he invites people in his home, home, own home. What is, what is Levi doing? He's opening up his life so people can find new life in Jesus Christ. <coughs> Isn't that beautiful? And friends, this is the call of God that, that yes, we follow him, but, but in the end, Christians, we're encouraged to go to people to follow him too. Right? We, we have this great invitation from God. This is our calling. This is what we've been talking about. This is our calling. Our calling is Jesus and people for Jesus. That's our calling. That, that's your life in a nutshell, and it's a great life, a joyful life. The good life is Jesus and getting people to know him. Right? I don't know about you. I'm not inviting anybody to my house because I'm a little particular about certain things, and maybe you are too. But there's, there's, a certain, there's a certain something about us that needs to be open so that we can share the gospel to other people. What is Levi truly doing in this story? Not only is he opening up his heart, Levi is also sharing his story with other people. I can imagine this. Go here with me. Again, don't make assumptions. I'm going to go there just a little bit today. I can imagine Levi going to his friends and saying, hey, man, you got to come to dinner tonight. I'm bringing Jesus. And his friends had to notice a little, different, a little difference in him, right? Right? They're like, no, no, Levi, man, we got to go collect more taxes. We got to go do more of this. We got to go, go defraud more people. He's like, no, 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 no. I'm done with that life. I'm done with that. I'm done in those ways. And I want you to meet the one who made it all happen. Because when you meet Jesus, you're never the same. Isn't that beautiful? When you meet Christ, you're never the same. It changes everything. It changes the narrative. It changes the story of your life. In the story of a life, you're not the hero. Jesus Christ is the hero of your story. And here's what I want to say today. You and I, we all have a story in this room today. Because you and I were once Levi. Right? We were once sitting at the tax booth, far from God. We were once doing our own thing, and Jesus wasn't in it, right? But somehow, some way, Jesus came to the story, and he changed everything. So what are we called to do in this particular scene? Well, we're called to share our story. We're called to, to, to remind people, hey, I'm new. And let me tell you of the one who made me 
new. And sometimes sharing your story isn't so much what you do with your mouth, but it's what you do with your life, right? Right? It's what you do with your life. It isn't just, again, going on the corner and telling everybody, I'm new, I'm free, and there's no context, there's no relationships or any of that. Sometimes sharing your story is just living your life newer and freer because of the forgiveness that's in Christ Jesus today. That's what it means to, be, to, to share your story, right? right? I, I don't stand up here as a man just trying to do the work because I'm an employer here. No, what I'm doing here is sharing my story. Because I, like you, was once Levi, far from God. And he opens his home. Let me ask you a question. What, how can we be like Levi today before we close? How can we be like Levi? Well, number one, I think we need to open up our hearts and be vulnerable with people. Right? I think we need to open up our hearts. But number two, I think we have to be willing to share our story. I think we need to be willing to, to be people who realize you have a story, and it's a story that's worth to be told. Because you don't write a book and don't distribute it, right? <laughs> and just keep it in-house, but you share it, right? That's the same thing with you. I think, I think, I think what Levi teaches us, teaches us is that you and I, our brokenness and our past is not, does not go to waste, Right? What is compelling his friends to go to see Jesus and meet with him? That Levi was once far, but now he's near. That Levi's a new man. And what's going on in this story? God is using Levi's brokenness. God is using Levi's past, right? His past self to show how good he is. Can I just tell you right now, your past does not go to waste, right? Your, your broken past, the past that you do not want anybody to know about, you are ashamed about, that you don't want, and you don't want the skeletons to come out of the closet, you don't want any of that. In Christ Jesus, it doesn't go to waste. It's actually the thing that makes you attractive, right? Am I right? It's actually the thing that, that makes you attractive. The thing that you struggled with is the thing that draws people to Jesus, Want to know what draws people to Jesus? It isn't perfect preaching. It, it, it isn't just coming up here screaming and yelling. You know what it is? It, 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 is, it, it, is, it, is, it is pointing people to the previous struggle, to the previous brokenness, but realizing that there's a newness now in your life. I want you to know in Christ Jesus, your past does not go to waste. Right? And there's a lot of shame when it comes to our past, am I right? There's a lot of shame when it comes to our old selves. But Jesus says, no, I'm going to use that too. I'm going to use the new you, but I'm also going to use the old you as well. Here's what I want to say, point number four. Without Jesus Christ, friends, you and I remain sick. You and I are sick. Jesus says, I've come not to call the righteous. You know what Jesus says? He says, I didn't come for those who act like they got it all together. I didn't come for those who just stick up their nose and cover up their brokenness and act like they're perfect. You know what Jesus says? I've come to call the sick. Come to call the sick. And, and the scripture teaches us that Jesus bore our sicknesses. He bore our sicknesses on his body. And Christ Jesus himself, through his suffering, through his stripes, let me ask you a question today. What does Christ need to heal in your life? What, what does Christ need to clean up? What, 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 is, what does the great physician and the great cleaner need to do? What does he need to do? What, what, are, what are some things that you need to open up your hearts and your lives today? What are some things Christ needs to clean up? But also, notice Levi. Levi gets up. Luke actually tells us in his gospel about this story. Levi, said, uh, uh, Levi did this in the gospel of Luke. He left everything to follow him. Let me ask you a question. What do you need to leave behind to follow Jesus better? Right? What are some tax boots we need to get up from? What, what, what are some things that we need to ourselves realize that this isn't 
This isn't encouraging or, or helping my, my relationship with Christ. It's actually burdening and pulling it back. What is it? Is it a relationship that you're in that you know is not good? That you know is not healthy? Right? Is it a, is it a group or, or, or whatever it may be? What are some of the things we need to get up from? We need to rise from to follow Jesus so we can have more of him. So we can be the treasure of our hearts. So we can do some spring cleaning in our hearts. So we can be the great physician that he wants to be to you. Listen, yes, I believe, I, I believe, you know, when you come to Christ, it's a one-time thing called conversion. But it's, there's also this thing called sanctification. For that's the ongoing process where God is making you newer and newer and newer and newer and newer and newer. And we need to be open to that. We need to invite the great physician into our lives to heal some things, to do surgery, to clean up whatever mess that we've created so that you and I, listen friends, you and I will have close connection with him. What are some of those things? Let's pray. Dear Father, I, I too am a man that is broken. I, too, am a man that is in need of some cleaning. I, too, am a man who was in need of some serious surgery. And, Father, today I call upon you, not just someone who gives me things, but someone who can heal the very thing that is in me, Lord. Do within me that you did within Levi, the great work that you did. And, Lord, I, I pray that I can be the, 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 the type of person that would open up my life so that people may have the good life in Jesus Christ. I pray, I pray, Lord, that I can be a pointer of Jesus. I pray that I realize I'm not the point. I'm just the pointer. And the point is Jesus Christ. But Lord, you know I'm not going to get that right every time. You know that I'm going to fall short in many areas when it comes to that. But your grace is sufficient. Your grace is good. And Lord, I pray that I can, I can be the person that would be influential to the point where people would see Jesus not through my perfection, but through the past brokenness that you healed in my life. I pray that we can do that more and more. I pray that we can be the church. I pray that we wouldn't just see Christianity as just coming and hearing a sermon, but it would be people who are living the sermon, sharing the story, being the people that you've called us to be. Would you help us, I pray. In your son's perfect name, as we pray. Amen.